Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Let's try that again. Woo. <clears throat> Sorry about that. When you haven't spoke to anyone out loud all morning, your voice can be kind of crackly. Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to my photography masterclass. Welcome to Adobe Live. My name is Terry White, worldwide photography evangelist for Adobe. It's my pleasure to be here. And it's my favorite day of the week because I get to spend time with you on a Friday where I get to spend an hour talking about thing, all things photography. Today, we're going to be taking a look at uh, some of my favorite tips and tricks on Lightroom and Lightroom Classic. So basically all things Lightroom. And uh, for those of you who are new, um, thank you for joining me. Thank you for watching the replay. Uh, thank you for watching wherever you're watching from, whether it's over on YouTube, I can see Aswin over there, whether it's over on this other YouTube, I can see Timothy over there, whether it's on Facebook, I don't see anybody over there yet, or Twitter, however you're watching, that's awesome. But if you really want to participate in the chat, you want me to see your questions or comments, opinions, whatever, head over to b.net slash Adobe Live. That's the one chat I'll be focused on after this intro. So I won't get a chance to look at all the other windows and all the other chats. Uh, I'll be focused on this one. So if you really want me to see you, head over there. Uh, but if not, you can hang out and watch wherever you want to watch from. That's cool too. All right. So uh, today we're going to spend, um, like I said, close uh, another 52 minutes or so on just some of my random favorite tips and tricks and answering questions that I get all the time. I'm going to start with some of those topics, like just people that are asking um, the same questions over and over and over again. Uh, Shari, it is called grayness. That's what it is. <laughs> She's like, what's on your chin? It's, it's, it's gray stuff. Anyway, um, with that said, let's go ahead and dive right in. So I'm going to switch off that and let's go over to my desktop. And I've got Lightroom Classic open. Like I said, I'm going to be pretty much bouncing around uh, multiple versions of Lightroom, so multiple um, Lightroom products. And um, and I'm going to show something in mobile too, at least one or two things in mobile. Um, I should probably launch that program while I'm thinking about it. Let's go ahead and get Reflector going too. And while we've got this going, matter of fact, let's start with that. Let's get this one out of the way. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Let's go screen mirroring. Let's go to my computer. I'm just gonna get my phone up so I can just go ahead and get this out of the way now. So that way um, we can dive right in. It's giving me a code that means nothing to you, but means everything to me. Uh, 2740 is the code for now. And let's go ahead and pop up the phone here. If all things are working well and good, all things are working well. Awesome. Okay, so I, I brought you to this screen because this screen is in your Lightroom on your mobile device settings. So I went into settings and I tapped on import in the Lightroom app. And the reason I wanted to come to this is because I get this question all the time. I get this question of, if I shot photos with my phone, like my, my camera app on my phone, the one that's built into your iOS or Android device, how do I get those images into Lightroom on my phone and therefore sync to Lightroom on my desktop ultimately? And this is these are my settings. This is what I prefer to do. So that if I shoot on my phone, like I just bring up my phone's camera and take a picture, that the next time I launch Lightroom, those pictures and videos will automatically be imported and synced. So that way I don't have to think about it. I have to. Um, I would rather not think about picking and choosing to import. If I import some ones I don't need, like, you know, I, I, I took a shot of something for reference or I took a photo of something I need to send someone. Those I don't need in Lightroom. But I'd rather go back and delete those than always have to pick and choose which ones to import. Because nine times out of 10, if I pull up my camera, it's to take a picture of something important, nine times out of 10, that that one, that that one 10% of the time where it's not important, I'll just delete those images out of Lightroom if it brings them in. So I would rather just get them all, pick and choose the ones I don't need, and that way I got them all. Um, 
you'll notice that there is a selection for turning off screenshots because what used to drive me crazy is I don't want screenshots. I'm usually if I'm taking a screenshot with my phone, like of a website or a receipt or something like that, I don't need that stuff in Lightroom. So luckily now screenshots is a separate category and can be turned off. So I import automatically photos and videos that are shot with my phone every time Lightroom is launched. So if I shot 10 pictures yesterday, launch Lightroom today, those 10 pictures will come in. If I shoot a video right now, and next time I launch Lightroom, that video will come in. And they will, since they're in Lightroom, they're automatically synced to your all photos in Lightroom on desktop, and they're synced to wherever you chose in your preferences in Lightroom Classic on desktop. Because if you've got syncing turned on in Lightroom Classic, those images go up to the cloud and come back down to Lightroom Classic. So that's why, um, that's why I, or that's the question I always get is how do you, how do you set this up? And this is how you set it up. All right. So I just wanted to get that out of the way since I was looking over at my phone. Let's get the phone out of here now. We might come back to the phone. I don't know. But anyway, let's, let's continue on. Let's also get this back open. Good, good, good. Okay. So the next thing we're going to talk about is um, just, just a change that was made. And this is more of a tip a change that was made in the way that we zoom in Lightroom, the way that you zoom into a photo. Now, over on the upper left-hand corner, it used to say fit in window, one to one, one to two, one to three, one to four. That's all gone now. Um, you will see uh, now the ability to just simply zoom in to whatever area of a photo you want by holding down a command key on Mac or control key on Windows. So for example, if I wanted to zoom into this, this is a statue in Detroit, by the way. If I wanted to zoom into this, this gold uh, globe that's being held here, I can click, but that's gonna like take me into too far. Basically, that's gonna take me into whatever the last magnification I was at. But if I hold down my command key, and here, let me show you what the icon looks like. If I hold down my command key or control key on Windows, you notice that it gives me a little marquee, letting me, let me pick and choose not only how much I want to see zoomed, but where I want to see it. So if I hold down the marquee and drag with my mouse hand, it zooms in perfectly to that spot. Now, how do you get back out? Just click. If you just click, that will take you back out. So same thing over here. If I wanted to see the statue closer and see if it's in focus, see if it's sharp enough, I can just click and it takes me back to that statue. I want to go up here to see what these seals say. Same thing. I can just click on that and I can see that uh, the seal looks good. Okay, so that's just a, a new way of zooming um, that isn't tied to a one-to-one -one or a specific zoom percentage or ratio. All right, I saw a question. Um, when will we see Panorama merge in Lightroom on mobile, like iPad, iPhone? I, I would love to see it there. Um, I've been asking that question too. So I, I guess whenever the Lightroom team gets around to it. Um, and I think that just... I, I, I don't know this to be a fact, but I would, I would guess the reason that it hasn't been a priority is because if you're on mobile, like my phone already has a panorama feature, so I would have to be shooting with another device and bring those images in to merge a panorama on my phone. Yes, I do that, but I'm just saying that's probably why it hasn't been a priority to get it done. Um, not say that it won't ever happen, not to say that it'll happen next week, not to say that it won't happen at all. I don't know, but my guess is that's why it hasn't happened yet is because Panorama is just one of those features that you can already shoot with the built-in apps on your phone. Okay, um, uh, did I see another one? Do, 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 do. Nice to see photos of my own ho old hometown. Craig, it's my old hometown too. All right, uh, so let's go ahead and um, get to my next tip. All right, my next tip is uh, about super resolution. I think I showed this tip in one of my former classes when the feature first came out, but I wanna make sure I cover it just in case I don't or didn't. Uh, so here's a photo. This is one of, uh, one of my aunts. And I only have, as far as I can tell, a very low resolution of this shot. It's a very old photo from back from 2005. And uh, the only one I can find is a super small 815 pixel by 774 pixel image. It's, it's tiny. 
So she has passed on. And if I want to print this out in a bigger print, I would prefer to have a higher resolution. So now built into Lightroom Classic, Lightroom, and, um, and Camera Raw. That's when I showed it. I showed it in Camera Raw. I remember I did a video about it. But anyway, on Masterclass, in, in Lightroom, Lightroom Classic, and Camera Raw, you have something now called Super Resolution. It came out first in Camera Raw, and it was in Camera Raw for a couple months before Lightroom got it. So now we got it in Lightroom as well. All right, so let's right click on this and you get the ability to choose enhance. The enhance menu has been there for years, but it didn't have this feature when you go into it. The feature is called super resolution. And what super resolution simply does is it doubles the image resolution, ideal for large displays and prints, without any loss of quality. We've been upscaling and upsampling and up resing images for years. But the problem has always been, if you compared them side by side, the up version looks slightly softer, slightly less in focus, slightly less detailed, because it had to make up the pixels along the way to make it bigger. And so it didn't look as sharp, it didn't look as good, it didn't look quite the same as the original. The idea behind Super Resolution is that it does look exactly like the original. So if you got a good original, you're going to have a good Super Resolution. You got a bad original, it's going to look just as bad. So don't think it's going to improve what you had. It's just going to make it look the same. So small image that looks good and sharp and in focus will be a bigger image that looks good, sharp and in focus. And side by side, you won't be able to tell the difference with the naked eye. All right. So if I go to Super Resolution, by default, it will create a stack. I'm going to, which means it will stack the two images together as one icon. I'm going to turn that off because I want to be able to see them side by side. All right, so now we'll go ahead and click Enhance. It will process it in the background and it will create a new RAW file, which it just did. And I can already see the, the higher resolution, 1630 by 1548. So it literally doubled the resolution. Those are times two, both of those dimensions. And now if we look at these images side by side, here, let's go to Loop View. There's the original and there's the uh, enhanced version. So original, Enhanced version. I cannot see any difference. And here, let's zoom in on the enhanced version. I And let's zoom in on the original. Uh, hang on, I'll have to zoom in this way because it's so small. Let's zoom in on that one. I, I can't see any difference in the pixels whatsoever. So that's the, uh, that's the idea behind super resolution is that they give you a duplicate of that image twice as big. Question always comes up, is it possible to, to use super resolution more than once on the same shot? Yes, it is. But um, we, 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 we don't make it easy for you because you kind of, so here's what would happen. If I, if I went to do it on the, the new one now, the new DNG that just happened, and I go, oh, let's make it twice as big as that, and I go to enhance, it's going to say, this photo's already enhanced. Now, that's just stopping you from a technical standpoint because it's a DNG and it's saying that you've already done this. There's nothing stopping you from exporting that out as a JPEG and doing it again, or exporting out as another file and doing it again. So you would just have to do it manually that way. You'd have to export this new one out, bring it back in, and then run it again. So it'll take you a couple extra steps, but you can absolutely do it more than once. Um, does super resolution work on images that have been edited? Sure. There's, there's no requirement that the image has to be uh, not edited, the original, blah, 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 none of that. It'll work on an image you give it. Um, and, and that was an old JPEG that I gave it. But if it's already been run, it will detect that it's been run, and you just need to export it out again and, and run it again. So I have done it more than once um, by doing that trick. All right, next up, let's because uh, we can talk about super resolution all day. Let's move on. Uh, this is one that people run into all the time by accident is they can't tell that their images are selected. So for example, you might have done it on purpose or you might have done it by accident. You hit Command A and all your images are now selected. So they got like a, a, a lighter color gray um, uh, border around the images. So what will happen is people will start doing things and it starts doing them to all of them. And they're like, no, I didn't want it to do it to all my images. Why is this happening? Why is it marking all my images with three stars? Why is it marking all my images with a picked flag? Because they don't know that they're selected. So 
I always teach people in Photoshop, if you don't know if something's selected, you hit Command or PC, Control D to deselect. No matter if you can't even see the selection, the selection's off canvas somewhere or off, sorry, off view somewhere, it's got this little thing selected, you don't even know where it is, just simply hit Command D and you know you've deselected. So that way then you can move on and do whatever you wanna do. Well, Lightroom has the same kind of thing for uh, selections. If we go into Edit, there is the same option of select none. So Command D. If you, if you can't tell your images are selected or things are happening to multiple images or you just want to deselect all the images that are selected, just choose select none or the same keyboard shortcut as Photoshop. Control or Command D and that will deselect all your images. Now, here's another one that happens. You select multiple images and you, you decide you want the middle one selected, but, but not the other ones. So what will happen is that you, oh, here's what, ha this is what typically what happens. Oh, I don't, if, if I'm clicking on these, they're just, they're still all selected. It's just now this one is what we call the most selected image, but I really only want this one selected. So what will happen, this is typical workflow is I need to click off all of them. I'll click on this one and then go back and click on the one I want. Been there, done that, right? You don't have to do it that way. So if you want to, let's say they're all selected, and I only want to select the middle one and deselect the other four. If you click on the thumbnail of the image, that does nothing. That just, they're all still selected. It just makes that one the most selected. But if you click anywhere outside the image area, anywhere in this, this um, film, this background of the thumbnail, then it will just select that one, deselecting all the rest. So that when I learned that tip, I think it was Benjamin Ward that showed that on a, on, a, on a video one day, I was like, oh my God, where was that all these years? I've needed that. Because I never think to click outside the image area in the same thumbnail. I always click on the image. And clicking on the image will select the image, but clicking, uh, when you have more than one selected, clicking outside the image will just deselect everything else and select that one image. Okay, so that's uh, deselecting, selecting. Uh, oh, and by the way, here's another one just for people that are new. Um, I want to select the first one, the third one, and the fifth one. So we know we can hold down the shift key to select a range. We know that we can select all with Command A or Control A. But if I want to select non-contiguous photos, then I would hold down my Command key on Mac or Control key on Windows, and then I can select the ones I want. Now, um, people usually ask, well, why, why are you selecting more than one photo? Like, why would you ever need more than one photo selected at the same time? Because you want to do the same things to those photos. So if I want to mark them all five stars, now that they're all selected, I can hit the number five and they're all selected. If I want to mark them as a pick or reject, I can pick or reject them. I can do whatever, I, if I want to give them a color label like um, blue, I can make them all blue. So whatever it is I want to do, that's why I'm selecting multiple images. And even if I want to go into develop and develop multiple images at the same time, which is another tip that's coming up, that's the reason I would select multiple images. All right, so let's uh, undo, undo, and yes, Lightroom has multiple undos, and then we can just get back to the image we want. Okay, next up. Uh, that is the next tip. We're gonna do multiple multiple images, multiple edits. All right, so I took these images uh, in Detroit the yesterday, I think, the day before yesterday, I was at a conference. Um, and I wanna apply the same edits to all of these. So these, these, four train, these four train images at the airport. Uh, so I select them all, I shift selected them. Now I head over to the develop module and in the develop module, uh, this is the magic button down here at the bottom. When you have, you, you won't see this button unless you have two or more images selected. So if you only have one image selected, this, and let me show you what you get. If you only had one image selected, then it's, it turns into previous. So that's why a lot of people don't even see that button because they don't go into the develop module with multiple images selected. So if I go into the develop module, I have multiple images selected, then that button that said, used to say previous turns into this button. It's an on off. By default, it's on sync. So if you've never touched it, yours is likely on sync. But if you, um, 
if you hey andrew hey uh, sandy head over to b.net slash adobe live if you want me to see your your chat anyway if you um turn this on and i turn it on and i leave it on the only time i turn it off is when i show people what it is <laughs> so i it's on 100 percent of the time for me because what that button does is it says if you have two or more photos selected it could be two it could be 20 it could be 2000 it could be 20,000, whatever it is if you have two or more photos selected Whatever you do to one happens to all of them. So for example, if I now zoom out so we can see this, even though I'm only editing one photo, the most selected photo, by the way, that's what that means. That's the photo you're looking at, even though the other four or the other three are still selected. And you make a change. Let's say I hit the, um, I hit the auto button and that will make the, see how it briefly said, hey, we've applied that change to four photos. If I bump up the texture, uh, hey, texture has been updated for four images. If I um, brighten up, brighten up the uh, exposure, the exposure has been updated for four images. And we keep, that's a new feature where we keep flashing that to remind you that you are editing multiple images because sometimes you might forget that you have multiple images selected. So it's just a reminder, hey, everything you're doing to this one image is happening to the other three. So if I now click on the other three, they're just as bright, just as um, textured, just as exposed as the first one because I had multiple images selected and I had auto sync turned on. Now, I said this, would, this, this class would be for both versions of Lightroom. Lightroom doesn't have an auto sync. Lightroom Classic does. So how would you do this in Lightroom? Let's switch over to Lightroom and I'll show you. So here's Lightroom and I can make these thumbnails a little smaller. There we go. Here's Lightroom, not Lightroom Classic. So this is the, the other version of Lightroom on desktop. And let's say I select this photo and I go in and edit it. There is no select multiple and you, you do them all to one. You can only select one at a time when you're editing. So now that I, I've got this image selected and I go in and I start doing things to it. I go in and I choose uh, landscape for my profile and I choose um, under light. Uh, we auto tone this and we make it a little brighter, great. And I choose my um, color, I choose my white balance as uh, cloudy. And I go in and do all these things to it. Now I want that to happen to the next four images, whatever it was I did. Then what I would have to do is go up to edit and copy. So when you copy, you're copying your edit settings. See where it just said that? And now if I select multiple images, and I go up to edit and paste, and I can't even do it while I'm in this view. I have to be in this view. There we go. Edit and paste. It will paste those edits to those other ones. Now, you can do a copy paste in Lightroom Classic as well. So even if you say, well, it's too hard for me to pick and choose all the different photos I want to I wanna do at one time, even though you still got to pick and choose them to paste, but whatever, whatever your reasoning is, you can copy and paste both in both applications. The only difference is Lightroom Classic has that do it all at once. Lightroom has copy paste and Lightroom on mobile has copy paste. So even if you did it on your iOS or Android or your iPad or whatever, you can still do the same thing. You can copy and paste the same edit to 10, 50, 1,000, how many ever images you need to paste those edits to. Um, so that is how you would do it. Now, there's one more thing, one more um, feature I, I really like in um, when I'm edit when I'm when I'm applying adjustments to let me let me put it this way when I'm applying adjustments to a photo and the next photo may or may not need the same adjustments or it may need to be tweaked a little bit differently so everything I've shown you so far is apply the exact same adjustments to all the photos that you select but what if I want to adjust one, go to the next one, maybe adjust it the same, maybe not. That, that's, that's a different workflow. So let me go into this photo. Let's go into develop. Now I'm only on one photo, so I don't have the auto sync because I've only selected one. But let's say I go in and I start doing things to this photo. Let's, let's run an auto tone on this one. And um, let's brighten up the shadows a little bit more. There we go. Not too much right there. Now, when I go to the next photo, which doesn't have any of that stuff done to it, or actually in this case it does. Here, let me let me reset this. Let's go back. 
All right, so we did this photo and we adjust whatever. And I go to the next photo and it doesn't have any of that stuff done to it. There is a button where auto sync used to be called previous. What that means is do what you just did to the last photo to this photo. And so I just hit previous and it did all the same things to it. So it lets me even jump around. I could go to this photo, skip over a photo. And even though they're not the same, I could hit previous and it will do the whatever it is I just did to that last one to this one. So you can, you can jump around and say, I, 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 this photo needs to be adjusted just like the last one. It needs to be, and where I really use this is let's go back to this photo for a sec second and let's crop it. And let's say the next photo needs to be cropped the same way. Well, now if I hit previous, it will be. So previous is great because it lets me do everything I did to the last photo, but now I can still tweak it because I'm still in this photo. So I can say, oh, well, this one needs to be cropped a little bit more from the right than the other one. So now when I go to the next one, if I were to hit previous, it's going to do everything. It's going to crop it from the right. And, oh, this one doesn't need to be cropped as far from the right, but it did everything else. So it lets me go through a series of photos after a shoot and apply a lot of the same things, but still make some of them different, if that makes sense. Because not everything in, on every, every uh, photo needs the exact same thing, but it might need a lot of the same things, and that way you get to do both. So Lightroom, well, here's the odd thing. Lightroom Desktop does not have the previous button, but guess what? Lightroom on mobile does. <laughs> if you go to your mobile device, here, let me go into mine. And let me see if that's still there. Cool, it's still there. If I go into my mobile device, and here, let me bring this over so you can see it. This is Lightroom running on my iPhone. And I go in and I make some adjustments. Let's go in and just do, uh, let's bring the exposure, let's super overexpose it. Okay. And then I go to the next photo, which is not super overexposed. If I scroll down here at the bottom, you see the previous button? Here's a previous button in mobile that's been there for a long time. So if I hit previous adjustments, it gets the same super overexposed. So I'm hoping that since the Lightroom team has done this on mobile, that they bring it over to Lightroom desktop. Um, because it's already there. It's already coded to do that previous feature. And that would be very useful for me in this version of Lightroom as well. So just know you've got uh, that ability to do both. All right, let's switch back over to Lightroom Classic for this next tip. And let's head back over here. And let me see, what do I wanna do next? Okay, this is one that I get, if I had to say, what Lightroom question do you get the most? Or what problem do people have the most? It's usually nine times out of 10, if it's a Lightroom Classic person, they come, they, they send me a message saying, I've screwed up. I lost all my images or all my images are disconnected or whatever. It's because they installed a brand new hard drive and they manually moved everything over to the new drive. And now Lightroom doesn't know where anything is anymore and it's all broke, messed up. So my advice has been and always will be, if you want to do anything in terms of management of the location of your photos, new hard drive, a different hard drive, uh, renaming images, whatever, deleting images, whatever it is, do it in Lightroom Classic. Don't go to the operating system to do it. The minute you leave Lightroom Classic and start messing with stuff in the operating system, that's when you're asking for problems. Unless you're an expert and you know exactly what you're doing. I'm not talking to you. If you're an expert and I know, hey, I know what I'm doing, Terry, I'm good at this, then that's not who I'm talking to. I'm talking to the people that don't know better and they go start messing around because, hey, it's easy to just move a folder, drag the folder, you know, go find it on your hard drive, go drag it to the new drive. Well, when you do that, Lightroom is, is, um, is, is path based, meaning it's looking for a specific path to this photo. So if I were to right click on a photo, this photo right here, oh, not that photo, this photo, let's go back up. 
this photo right here, and I were to right click on it, and I were to say, show me this photo in the Finder or Windows OS, whatever you're using, Windows um, Explorer, it will show me exactly where this photo is. And it's in a folder called for web for whatever reason, I'm not sure why. And that's on my desktop and it's in, uh, it's, it's in my iCloud drive. Now, if I, I'm on my operating system right now. If I rename that fo photo and I, I rename it with PMC, Photography Master, oh, hang on, hold on. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Masterclass. So now, I, hey, I, that photo should be called Masterclass. I'm going to do it. When I come back to Lightroom, Lightroom doesn't know where the original is anymore. It still has a smart preview because I built a smart preview. But when I go to this one, notice it says, hey, I know where the original is and I know where the smart, I have a smart preview. But now when I go to this one that I've messed up, it doesn't know where the original is anymore because I went and screwed with it in the operating system. So stop screwing with it. Because see the name? The name didn't get changed here. It doesn't know that there's a new name because you're doing stuff behind Lightroom's back. Stop cheating on Lightroom. Stop doing stuff behind Lightroom's back and life will be amazing for you. You'll never have any of these problems. So if you're going here and I now change this back. Oh, I didn't mean to double click on it. Sorry about that. I meant to double click on the name. There we go. And I... um and I delete that name that I added on and put it back to the original name. Now when I go back to Lightroom Classic, guess what? Oh, it's fixed. It now knows where it is. It knows where the original is now. It doesn't have to deal with just a smart preview. It knows where it is because the name is what it was in Lightroom. Now, if I want to change the name of this photo for whatever reason to Masterclass, whatever, change it here. You have the ability to change the file name right here in Lightroom. So if I change the art name and I add that master class onto the end of it, for whatever reason, now I've changed the name. And you're thinking, well, doesn't that only change it in Lightroom? No, it changes it in the operating system. So it's doing the same thing you did, but you're doing it now where Lightroom still knows where the original is. And the name got changed to what you wanted in the operating system and everybody's happy. So whatever it is that you think you need to do in the operating system can be done in Lightroom. So you're saying, well, Terry, how would I move the images to a different folder in Lightroom? Don't go do it in the operating system. So if you scroll up, you've got your folders. These are the actual folders on your hard drive. So if I were to go in and I were to say this photo that's in, in the, remember it was in the web folder, that's where it is. If I were to go create a new folder on another drive, for example, or uh, so let's, but I'm gonna pretend this is another drive. So let's say that we go create one on the desktop and we create, um, we create a, we add a subfolder and we call this subfolder master class just so you know it's real master class um i'll use someone's name shari all right so master class shari and i create that folder and i don't include anything so just going to create an empty folder there it is master class shari right there and i now take this image that um it was so important for me to move and i now move it to that folder it moves it it didn't copy it, it moved it. So if I go back out to my operating system now and I go back to the desktop, there's a Masterclass Shari folder with that image in it because that's what it's really doing behind the scenes is this managing your images on your operating system. So there's never a reason to ever do any of this in the operating system because whatever it is you want it to do, you can do it in Lightroom. You can move things around. You can rename things. You can move things from one drive to another drive. You can do all the things that you think you need to do in the operating system in Lightroom. And guess what? If you do it here, you'll never be caught, you'll never be texting me or sending me a, a message on social. I screwed everything up. I, I did everything in the operating system. And now Lightroom is messed up. Because if you do it in Lightroom, it knows where everything is. So stop doing stuff in the operating system. Okay. Yep. Uh, so whatever it is you're thinking you need to do, move something, change the name delete something, whatever, do it in Lightroom. There's nothing you can do in the operating system for your images that you can't do in Lightroom. So just remember that. All right, next up. 
Okay, uh, here's another one that, um, let me see, do I wanna do this one first? Yeah, let's do this one first. All right, so let's go to one of these. Let's go to this one. All right, so here's an image. And uh, downtown Detroit, uh, under the people mover, and I kind of want to, well, I want to straighten that building out. It's beg begging me to. But anyway, before I do any of that, uh, I want to create multiple versions of this photo. So there's two ways to do this. In Lightroom Classic, you've got multiple ways. So one of those ways is you can go into your, um, you can go into your photo menu and create a virtual copy. So create a virtual copy is exclusive to Lightroom Classic. Lightroom on your phone doesn't have this. Lightroom on desktop doesn't have this. This is a Lightroom Classic feature. It's one of my favorites. When you create a virtual copy, what you're saying is create another thumbnail in Lightroom. This did not create another file on your hard drive. It's only in your catalog. So create this extra thumbnail, which Lightroom treats as another image. And then you can do whatever you want to do to it. It does not affect the original. So if I come in here now and I say, hey, this, this image is bugging me because that building is leaning. And I were to go to transform and I were to try an auto upright. There we go. Now my building's not leaning anymore. And I were to go back in and I were to do um, some other stuff like, uh, let's do daylight for the that. And let's do an auto tone for that. And so now I've done these things and we can even... Um, Add some texture, add some more vibrance. So we've done all these things to this photo. If I go back to the original, none of those things were done. But if I go to my virtual copy, both of those, all of those things were done. So what's the point of this? Why would you make a virtual copy? Why wouldn't you just do it to the original? Because now I could go in, let's go back to the grid. Now I could go in and create another virtual copy, which is, by the way, I use the keyboard shortcut, command quote. That will create a new virtual copy. And that new virtual copy is still from the original. So now I go into this one and I do other things like, first of all, let's fix the building. Auto upright, great. And let's say I want this one to be a black and white and I want this one to be cropped. All right. So now I've got this one and this one. Here's the original. Here's the one where I fix things. Here's the one where I fix things and made it more of a portrait in a black and white. And I could just keep doing this. I can make, I can have a thousand virtual copies. I can have as many virtual copies as I want. So why would I make virtual copies? Because I want to now take all three and export all three out as separate new images. And since it will derive them from the original, you'll have the same resolution, same everything as the original. So that's what virtual copies are for, is when you want to see them side by side, all your edits, and you want to ultimately output multiple images that have all these things done to them. So if I need three JPEGs, one with the original, one with the fixes, one with the fixes in black and white, then I would end up with three JPEGs with all of those um, things done to them. Now, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it, go back to the original, go back to develop, is using a feature called um, snapshots. If I scroll, those are presets. If I scroll up, here we go, snapshots. So snapshots is, the, is virtually the same equivalent to Lightroom's versions. So snapshots in Lightroom Classic, versions in Lightroom and Lightroom on mobile. So what's a version? A version is, I can create a version called uh, original. All right, so there's a version. Now I could go in and do um, the transform that I did. So uh, auto upright and um, all the stuff I just did. So daylight and auto tone and more vibrance and more texture. Okay, so then we'll create another snapshot of this one called um, fixed, <laughs> just for lack of a better term. All right, so now, and then I can go in and say, well, I want this one, this fixed version, but I want it in black and white, and I want it cropped, and uh, something like that. And I make another snapshot, and I call this one uh, B and W um, uh, fixed. Okay, so instead of me making three virtual or two virtual copies and having three icons, I have 
the same icon with these different versions I can go back to. I can go back to the original, I can click on fixed, I can go to black and white fixed. So, it's really a personal preference because when I show this, people say, well, why would I use one versus the other? Or why wouldn't I just use virtual copies? Or why wouldn't I just use snapshots? It, it just depends. Uh, if you wanna keep it as one icon in all your collections, then snapshots is more efficient. Because virtual copy creates all those different icons that you would, or thumbnails that you would then have to manage separately. You can put them all in different collections, but you would have to do all that manually. So this way, it, it just depends on what you like. And if you're in Lightroom or Lightroom on mobile, it's this, this is what you would have. It's called versions. You wouldn't have the ability to do virt or virtual copy. So it's just best, it, it's what you like best. All right, um, question. Is it best to import raw files from the camera? Uh, straight from said company software like Nikon provided and moving to then move to Lightroom Classic and Photoshop, right? Um, I don't know what you mean by um, straight from said company software. I don't know what that means. Like you don't need any special software. You can plug in a memory card and copy them to a folder where you want them to be, put them in the folder where you want them to be and then import them to Lightroom. Or you can have Lightroom import them right from the memory card. You don't need any, you don't need the manufacturer software to do any of that. So yes, it's best to import the raw images directly, either to your operating system, copy the folder, because a lot of people think that's faster. I think I've proven that that can be faster as well. And then import them into Lightroom Classic by just doing an add, or go to import right in Lightroom Classic and just, or Lightroom for that matter, and hit import, it, It's or add. It's you don't need anything else, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, next up. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, good. We get to go back to that series of photos I've been dying to get to. So, here's a series of images that are kind of like unedited. Uh, these were all shot in um, Iceland. Kind of a sunrise shoot. Got there early in the morning. The sky was kind of drab. But these were shot handheld to make a panorama. So I'm gonna right click, I'm gonna choose um, photo mark, and these aren't the originals, these are low res JPEGs. But I'm gonna do panorama, no they're not HDR, and that will create a panorama. And when I when I say handheld, I, I meant handheld to show you the problem you get is usually you end up with a lot of white space. And when you end up with all this white space, typically what you would end up doing in the past, you had no choice, like, oh, I don't want the white space, crop and you end up with a super short um, panorama. Luckily, we don't have to do crop anymore. So I can uncheck crop and now I have two choices. I used to have crop and boundary warp, but now I've got crop, boundary warp and fill edges. And I've made, the, made this joke and I apologize Lightroom team. I used to make this joke all the time, but now I understand there is a reason for it. I used to, under, I used to ask, well, why is boundary warp a slider? Why isn't it just on or off? Because either you want the stuff warped into place or you don't. Like, I, I, why, why would I go part of the way? Like, when would, when would I ever want it to be a little warped? And that was my joke. That was my running thing. But now I get why. Because with fill edges, which is brand new, that will use content aware fill technology to fill in that white space. So if we let it process, it will look at the surrounding pixels and fill them in but and that, that that's amazing that's great but here's the problem it starts to duplicate things that it doesn't know it doesn't know any better it's like okay you left a bunch of white space down here i see this hill so i'm going to duplicate it and i'm going to keep duplicating it until i fill up that area so now by having that on a slider I have the best of both worlds i can use a little bit of boundary warp to eliminate that duplication or improve the duplication, I should say. There we go. Maybe not completely eliminate it. And that way I get the best of both worlds. So I get the kind of, I can keep tweaking the boundary warp to not give me an exact duplicate when I do fill edges. So now I, I appreciate having it on a slider instead of it being on or off. So I take it all back.
Yeah, I, I would actually live with that. Okay, so now when I merge this, it's gonna, uh, I got auto settings turned on, which is really auto tone. It's gonna create a brand new um, panorama um, DNG, raw file from that. And if I go into develop now, I can keep developing it because that just put them all together and now I can, I can work further. So I can say, well, first of all, it's very crooked. So let's fix that. Let's go into the angle tool and let's straighten this out. There we go. Still going to lose some image, but at least it's straight. And then I could go in and start tweaking to my heart's content. So I could go in and it's already been auto tone, but I might go in and bump up the exposure a little bit and you'll graduate it filter. I'd probably take it into Photoshop and do a sky replacement, but just kind of getting some of this stuff done. Something more like that. Okay. I'd keep tweaking it, but you get the idea. And I'd probably go in, bump up the vibrance a little bit. Maybe even a little saturation and a little texture. Anyway, I, I keep tweaking. I actually go back to the originals and do it from the raw files. But anyway, um, uh, they know their settings best for raw since make changes in the camera. They know their settings the best for raw since they make the camera. According to Vincent Versace. Man. Okay, Keith, if that's your workflow, by all means, do that. Like, I don't do that because I think it's a waste of time. Um, I'm happy with, because basically what you're saying is you prefer the camera manufacturer's raw processor. And if that's the case, by all means, do that. I have, you know, and I, I love Vincent Versace. I haven't done enough to where I've seen, I haven't seen enough to where it made that big of a difference for me. But do you. All right, next up. Um, all right, let's get, go to this one. Changing the color of things has gotten a lot easier in Lightroom and Lightroom Classic. So I've got this um, this statue from Detroit, and there is it's, it's a statue, but they're wearing a it's wearing a physical shirt, like they they made a shirt and put it over the statue. I, I'd love to know how they did the arms, but I'm, I'm guessing the back is open and they just tied it. Anyway, um, but I don't like the blue. I don't like the blue in this shirt. So let's go in and use the adjustment brush. And let's set the adjustment brush preset to color. I'll just check it something here. I could actually set it to hue. I set it to hue because that's the new way to do it. And I'm just going to go ahead and grab my um, stylus. And I'm painting. Nothing's happening because I didn't make any hue adjustments yet. So I'm just kind of going all the way around and masking. I will be missing spots because I can't see what I'm doing yet but I'll go back and fill them in. And now that I've uh, painted it in, I did this on purpose this way so you would be able to see uh, the end result when I'm finished. All right, so now that I've done all this, and I'm sure I missed spots, but you have this new adjustment called local hue. And local hue means local adjustment, so adjustment brush, radio filter, graduated filter. And you can now go in and change the colors of whatever it is you apply it locally. So I could say, make it more red, make it more purple, make it more of a blue that I like. Let's say we make it green. Okay, so now I could go through and say, oh, you missed the spot up there and you missed all these spots. Let's go get those spots painted in. There we go. All right, I think I got most of it filled in. So now I can go to town on what the adjustment color will be. Still missed a few edges, but you get the idea. Now, while you're in here, uh, even though you're adjusting the hue, that does, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm seeing all kinds of spots. Hang on. While you're adjusting the hue, that doesn't mean you can't adjust other things. So for example, now I got the hue where I want it. Let's say I also want to bump up the saturation of that. And let's say I also want to, actually, I like the saturation where it is. Now, I oversprayed my paint. I can see paint on the edges of the statue. So all you do is make your brush smaller. Hold down your Option or Alt key to subtract. 
and I'm, my brush is still too big, but you get the idea. That lets me paint off the areas that I oversprayed onto. Um, so if you went too far, just simply use the Option or Alt key to take it off. Okay, and that's how we change the color of things in Lightroom. All right, next up. And, and don't paint the ribbon because <laughs> it will look pink now. Um, but that's how we would do it. All right, so uh, that looks like a breast cancer awareness ribbon. So there we go. We got my nice pink shirt. Next up, and we got like a few minutes left. Let's keep going. Dun, 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 dun. Um, so there's an old trick in Lightroom to like bring the focus in on whatever it is you're working on. So if I go to this image and I go into loop view and I hit the letter L that dims the lights, I called it Lightroom for a reason, hit the L again, that will turn the lights off. So now I can just focus on my image, even though the rest of the interface is there, everything still works, but L turns it all back on L dims everything else. L again turns everything off. So just remember the letter L shortcut. All right, next up, let's, uh, dun, 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 dun. oh, speaking of hiding things, so we did the L, L, L. You can also hit the tab key to turn off your side panels, especially when you don't need them because you're working on the image. Uh, you can also use the arrows uh, to turn, temporarily hide the top or the bottom film strip. If I can get down there without bringing up my dock, there we go. So you can uh, do those things and people tend to get a kick out of this one when I show it, even though I don't did shown it before you have this, um, you have the, these tools at the bottom, which you can turn on or turn off from this menu on the right hand side. So I could turn on flagging. I could turn on ratings. I could turn on all of the things I want, color labels, rotation, and it just gives me all their buttons down here, even though you can use keyboard shortcuts for all of these things. But one of the things I have turned on is the, the spray, the painter. And what the painter is good for is when you want to apply the same thing to multiple images quickly. Like, so you can apply labels, flags, ratings, metadata, settings, rotation. So let's do rotation because that's the most visual. So now I'm going to rotate, um, rotate left counterclockwise. So as I spray these images, I'm just dragging across, they're rotating those images and I can spray those or I can just click and those images will be sprayed. So if you want to spray the same keywords, that's a good tip. If you want to spray the same flags or pick fl or ratings, that, that would be the way to do it. Okay. So, and then you just put the painter back, just click back on the icon where it came from to put it away. All right, next up. All right, um, I never get a chance to show this unless I'm doing a specific video on it. So let me show it now. I'm gonna go to my browser. So I'm gonna go to my, my web browser. And if you go to your web browser, you can type in lightroom.adobe.com and sign in and you will get to all your synced photos. Um, Once you're there, you see all my albums are here and everything, but there's one thing I can do on the web that I can't do anywhere else. You can share galleries on desktop. You can do stuff on mobile, but the web has one feature. It's a technology preview actually that only exists on the web. I'm, I'm in a gallery or I'm in an album called uh, Hilton Head 2021. So these are sunrise images and I want to send them to a client to be proofed. In other words, to pick which ones they want. So uh, if you go, if you're in the web browser and you log in and you click on your icon in the upper right corner and you go down to technology previews, you want to make sure that you've turned on collaborative proofing. It's probably on by default, but just in case you don't see this button, turn it on. Now that it's on, and this is a technology preview, that means it's not finished yet. So there are some features we want, but it's not there yet. You will have this button at the very bottom behind me here. Let's go there. You have this button at the very bottom um, that looks like a checkbox over an image and it's called proofing. When you have that button and you click on it, that will take you into this area where you can share the album. So I can click um, enable proofing. It will create a custom link for this album. 
And you can limit the selection to how many ever photos the client is able to pick. So let's say I give the client the ability to pick 10 photos and then I give them the link. So if I, if I now, um, let me go back to that. If I copy that link and I were to go to an incognito browser window, so meaning I'm not logged in as me, and I paste that link in as I'm pretending I'm the client, this is what the client would see. And the client would get the ability to sign in. <laughs> they sign in with an Adobe ID, which is free to create, and they would be able to check off the ones that they want. When they check off the ones that they want, it comes back to my my Lightroom um, album. I will see the actual thumbnails and I can add them to a album. So there's even a button that says add to album. So select all the images, add to album, and I will know which ones the client picked. Now, there's some obvious things we would love to have for that because one of the most requested things is that the um, people want to be able to watermark the images that are in the album. There's no cust There's no way to do that unless you do it manually. They also want the ability to um, have multiple people do reviews. And right now you'd have to create multiple instances of the, sh of the sharing. For that. Hold on. There we go. They want to be able to uh, do a few other things. So hopefully this technology preview will get better. But I'm out of time. So I want to thank everyone. Have a great weekend. Cheers, everybody. We'll catch you on the next one.